Hey everybody, welcome back to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Welcome to our Monday night episode where we dive into health topics to help you achieve greater levels of health. If you're new to the Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain show, there are a couple different rules. Number one, type in where you're from and let me know you're listening tonight. I'd like to know how far our audience is reaching. Number two, make sure that you're sharing this information with somebody who you feel like could benefit from it. Remember what our goal is at glutenfreesociety.org and drpeterosborne.com. Our goal is to help 100 million chronically sick people find real answers to their health problems. And the only way we can do that is if you help us by sharing this information with people who need to hear it. So let me know where you're from and make sure you're sharing. Now tonight's topic is going to be all about yeast overgrowth. And this goes by a number of different names. It goes by, some people call it candida. Others call it yeast overgrowth, obviously. Fungus or fungi um, infection is a common, is a common name. So, so if you hear any of these things, yeast infection, candida infection, fungus or fungi infection, these are all basically yeast overgrowth in some form or derivative or type. So that's one of the things you want to get right out of the gate because so many people talk about candida and, and a lot of times you're not really aware that when they're talking about candida, they're really referring to a yeast overgrowth. Now there are different species of yeast and candida is a type of yeast. There are other forms of yeast, for example, um, mold growing inside of us. Mold is another example of what yeast is. Yeast is a form of mold, but there are a number of different species of mold. And some people are allergic to mold and some people have a yeast infection. And I don't want you to get those two confused either. Cause if you've ever gone to your allergist or doctor and they've done allergy testing and said, yes, you have a mold allergy. It's not the same thing as a yeast overgrowth, a candida overgrowth. Uh, again, there are other forms and other species of yeast. Candida is just one type. So, very, very important to understand those differences. Okay, looks like we got people tuning in already. Misty, hi, thanks for coming back. Misty with the um, Scleroderma and Functional Medicine uh, Facebook group from Denton, Texas. We got Kayla from Texas and Christine from Massachusetts. Oh, wow, we got Brigitte. I hope I said that right. Brigitte or Brigitte from Perth, Western Australia, 7 a.m. Thanks for waking up uh, with me today. And Linda from Saskatchewan, and I'm going to think, I think that's Canada. My One of my favorite mentors, Dr. Abram Hoffer, uh, was from Saskatchewan, Canada. And Mary Ann from Colorado, and Maxine from Pennsylvania, and Lynn from Australia. A lot of Australians tonight. And uh, Peru's from California, Los Angeles, Sally from San Diego, Marie from Toronto. Awesome. You guys just keep chiming in. Love to hear that we're reaching such a vast and broad area across the globe. So keep chiming in and let me know where you're from. So again, mold is the other one I didn't put up here, but again, sometimes referred to as a mold infection. And again, an overgrowth or infection is not the same as an allergy to mold. Now some people are allergic to mold and they also have a yeast overgrowth and that is like a double hit or a double whammy and I've seen that be the case in a number of folks but again don't get confused because they're not the same thing. Symptomatically speaking uh, a yeast overgrowth looks a lot like gluten sensitivity sim from a symptom perspective. There are a lot of different symptoms that can manifest but I'm going to talk about a few tonight that I think will really benefit you because you can see them. So we're going to pop up on the screen here a picture of some fingernails and toenails where there's an active yeast overgrowth underneath the fingers and toes. So what you're seeing on the screen are, are actual the yellow discoloration in the nail bed. That's mold, that's fungus, that's yeast growing. And what happens to a lot of people is that it can show up in the toenail like that. It can also show up when it's on the toenail. Oftentimes it's also growing inside the GI tract or it's also fostering inside uh, inside the body and other locations. Yeast overgrowth generally by the time we're seeing it show up in the skin or the toes, it's probably spread quite widely. Now sometimes what happens, there are forms of yeast that grow on the skin. If you've ever heard jock itch before or if you've ever heard of um, athlete's foot, 
These are forms of yeast as well. And you can see in the picture of the toe that I have there in the corner between the pinky toe and, uh, and the fourth toe, there's a little discoloration, a little red discoloration. That's actually the yeast growing on the skin, whereas what's underneath the nail bed looks a little bit differently. It looks white. So again, if you've ever had athlete's foot, a lot of times people who are most predisposed to athlete's foot are athletes, right? Athletes, hence the term athlete's foot. So that you're wearing socks and you're wearing shoes and you're sweating a lot and it's dark in your shoes and your feet are wet constantly from the sweat. And this can increase the ability for mold to grow. So if you are immunosuppressed, okay, or if, you're, if your um, immune system is not fully up to par, you're also predisposed to a yeast overgrowth. If you've been on the antibiotic recently, you're predisposed to a yeast overgrowth because remember antibiotics knock out the bacteria that help keep yeast at bay. They help keep mold or yeast overgrowth at bay. So if you've been on an antibiotic, this is one of the premium times or the prime times that we'll see yeast overgrowths begin to occur after a round or a course of antibiotics. So you can have yeast on the skin, you can have yeast in the nail beds. Some people develop what's called oral thrush where they'll have yeast growing or patches of yeast growing on the tongue. That's a possibility as well. Do we have that picture we can put up of the, of the yeast growing on the tongue? So this is an example of a very, very extreme case. And uh, if, you are, uh, if your stomach is somewhat sensitive, you might want to turn away. This is a very, very extreme case of yeast overgrowth on the tongue. Do we have that picture up yet? It's coming, guys, so just be patient with me. I'm glad I was able to warn you before you look. This is actually a very disturbing picture. So again, if you have a queasy stomach, uh, make sure that you're, that you're turning away. So yeast overgrowth can occur on the skin. It can occur in the tongue. It can occur, uh, it can occur vaginally for females. It can occur for men as well uh, in the groin area. Jock itch would be you know, one of the manifestations. Again, we got that picture up for you now. So those of you who want to take a look, you can at what a major yeast overgrowth. And this is a very severe one looks like on the tongue. Now, some people, they'll, they'll, they'll ask, hey, you know, I've got a white coating on my tongue. And I think it's very important to understand that a white coating on the tongue does not necessarily signify a yeast infection. That can signify uh, bacterial abnormalities. It can signify um, other problems. The key is that if you took a tongue depressor and you scrape the tongue, you're going to get debris and, and and, and fluid coming off of the tongue. In essence, the yeast is so severe, the thrush is so severe, it's basically growing on top of the tongue and you can scrape it off. So if you've got a coating on your tongue and you scrape it and nothing really comes off, that is not a yeast overgrowth. So don't get the two confused. A lot of people come to me thinking they have a yeast overgrowth when in fact they have gut dysbiosis and it's not quite the same thing. So again, yeast overgrowth on the tongue, you can usually scrape it off. And that's a really strong indicator that it's a yeast infection. Now, a lot of women, uh, particularly women, will also pick up urinary tract infections with chronic yeast overgrowth. So urinary tract, and what I, what I mean by saying that is, you know, in essence, where does yeast grow? If we look at the different locations, we said the skin, we said the tongue. Um, we also have nail beds as an option. Sinus cavities, a big option, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute, but we also have um, in the urinary tract. So, and they oftentimes will mimic a bacterial urinary tract infection. So a lot of women, this is one of the, the reason I say that is a lot of women, and again, a lot of women, because that's where I see it the most, will have a urinary tract infection. Their doctor will prescribe them an antibiotic. The urinary tract infection doesn't go away and actually gets worse because it's not really a bacterial urinary tract infection. It's a fungal or yeast-based urinary tract infection. And the thing that you want to do, and this is very, very important, if you're being prescribed an antibiotic and you really don't have a bacterial infection but you have a yeast infection, you want to ask for a culture. So you can have a urine culture done and ask them to culture it for mold or fungus or yeast and, and also bacteria. You can do the same thing in the sinus. You can have a culture done because those are the two areas where people tend to have infections. The sinus cavities where they have the, 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 basically the congestion, the really clogged frontal sinuses uh, 
um, where it can be hard to breathe, the nose will be clogged up, it can be hard to sleep, it can contribute to sleep apnea-like symptoms because it's very, very difficult to breathe with a, with a chronic sinusitis or a chronic infection. But a lot of doctors will assume that these two things are bacterial when in fact they're most commonly fungal. Now they can be bacterial, so it's important to have the doctor you, that you're seeing culture for both um, and understand that sometimes they're both there. So sometimes you can have both a fungal and a bacterial infection. You know, you can have more than one infection. And I see this very frequently um, in people's sinus cavities. We can do a culture and we can detect, you know, to a large degree of accuracy and sensitivity, what types of critters are growing up in the sinus cavities. And a lot of times it's multiple types of critters, things like staph and, and, uh, and, and other forms of yeast and bacteria like Klebsiella, very, very common for these to grow uh, in people, again, with chronic sinusitis. So understand that a lot of people think of a yeast overgrowth or a yeast infection as like a vaginal infection or an oral infection, but they're not thinking about their sinuses and upper respiratory infections or sinus infections being really caused by a yeast overgrowth. And it's one of the most common symptoms that yeast can cause or contribute to. So you want to be very, very aware that that's the case. Now, one of the other side effects, so again, antibiotics can be one of the worst things that can be done, in essence, what causes, we look at what causes a yeast overgrowth. Antibiotics, in my experience, is one of the biggest causes because so many doctors will prescribe antibiotic use without properly doing a culture to even ascertain whether it's a bacterial infection or another type of infection. And antibiotics don't effectively treat a yeast overgrowth but they can make it worse. So antibiotic use can contribute to this. Immune suppression. And there are a number of different medications that naturally suppress the immune system. And most of these, the reason I'm talking about it right now is because they relate to what a lot of times people go on when they have chronic sinus problems or allergy, outdoor allergy. What they perceive to be outdoor allergy problems oftentimes can be a yeast overgrowth. So you could actually not really truly be having allergies, but have a chronic sinusitis as a result of yeast overgrowth. And if you're taking drugs like Benadryl or Singular, which are drugs that inhibit the immune system's capacity to fight, what it does by in in inhibiting the immune system, you reduce the symptoms, but you inhibit the immune system's capacity to fight so you can make a yeast overgrowth or, or an infection that much more worse. Other drugs that can suppress the immune system aside from allergy medications are things like corticosteroids, steroids. Okay, so if you've got, again, this is oftentimes with chronic sinusitis, a lot of times doctors will give you an injectable or a nasal steroid um, to, to, to treat the congestion when in fact, if it's, again, if it is a yeast overgrowth, you're suppressing the immune system, you can potentially make it worse. And this is why so many people go back and forth to the doctor. They're on chronic steroid use, they're taking steroids up the nose, they're on chronic allergy medications. So they're constantly doing these things repetitively over and over and over again, but the outcome is more immune suppression, right? And if, the, if, the, if it doesn't go away, the next outcome oftentimes is we get an antibiotic because we want to make sure that a lot of times doctors say, well, we just want to make sure that it's not an infection. So let's go ahead and throw an antibiotic at it too. And so you kind of get immune suppressants, antibiotics, and steroids, uh, you know, ad infinitum. Um, and what ends up happening is nothing, right? The problem stays you're still struggling, only now you're immunosuppressed. Now there are other things that can suppress the immune system where we'll see a lot of yeast overgrowth are in people that have immunosuppression types of diseases, chronic autoimmune disease where the immune system is now starting to deteriorate. Cancers, people on chemotherapy and radiative therapy, those things suppress the immune system. HIV patients, those people have immune systems that don't work adequately and one of the biggest side effects of a, of a poor functioning immune system is yeast overgrowth. We're also gonna see people pick up yeast overgrowth from immune suppression, not necessarily caused by drugs, but caused by environmental molds. And so if you live in a flood, like in my area, where a lot of the homes flooded because of the hurricane and you picked up mold in your home, that mold exposure, that chronic mold exposure, can the, the mycotoxins that mold produces can suppress the immune system. That's why they're linked to cancer. And that can lead to, again, these chronic problems with yeast overgrowth. And then again, one of the other big causes is what is in your food.
your diet. And I want to focus on that a little bit because this is the number one area people have the most control over that if they would just take action and control it, they could clean up so many of their different problems. Let's see here. So, we've got um, Tracy from South Carolina and Jamie from Dearborn, Michigan and Christy from Iowa, Jeff from Wisconsin, Vicki from Illinois. Yeah, more of you chiming in. Uh, Laura from Canada. Thanks for sharing, Laura. Okay, so one of the things that, that uh, I want to make sure that you all understand too is that go ahead and get your questions in. I'm going to go do my best to try to get through them all. If I miss some, it's not because I'm trying to ignore you. I take them first come, first serve, but my feed doesn't always pump them in uh, accurately. So I'm going to try to do my best. So if I miss your question, I, I apologize in advance. Okay, so I want to talk about diet because... And it, let's, um, if we can, let's. I've got a couple of studies on something called auto brewery syndrome, and I and I want to put those up just to kind of show you um, how diet really what what can happen. So one of the things about diets, and one of the diets that's really popular right now, is the ketogenic diet. And the ketogenic diet is popular because so many people are carbohydrate. Toxic. Now, when I talk about auto brewery, because that's one of the things that can happen, it can make you mildly intoxicated. Auto brewery is when you overconsume carbohydrates and you have an existing yeast overgrowth, and the car and the yeast overgrowth converts the carbohydrates, and this yeast overgrowth is typically in the gut, converts the carbohydrate into alcohol. And this has been studied a number of different times. There's actually a recent study done showing how different infant formulas, because they're so high in carbohydrates, can actually create yeast problems and alcohol problems in babies. There's actually one researcher was linking it to sudden infant death syndrome because these baby formulas are so, so high in carbohydrate sugars. And mo most of them contain corn sugar and, and soy-based sugars. So again, not the healthiest thing for babies to be eating. And if that baby has uh, a yeast overgrowth internally and they're eating a bunch of carbohydrates, over-consuming carbohydrate, this can happen and that's alcohol production. So if you have, let's just say you're one of those people that has genetic mutations for methylation, you don't process alcohol as well and you're creating a chronic source of alcohol every day because you're slowly, you're eating aggressive quantities of carbohydrates, um, that can lead to slow, steady poisoning of your liver because your liver's got to process that alcohol. And if it's already not working as well as, let's say, somebody who doesn't have genetic mutations that affect alcohol metabolism, then that puts you at greater risk for something like an auto brewery syndrome where you can start to develop. And I've actually, the worst case I've ever seen was a woman who came to my office. And I literally, I thought she was drunk. She was slurring her speech. Uh, her skin was jaundiced. Her eyes were yellow. She didn't drink. She was not an alcoholic. She hadn't drank in years, but she had a severe, severe yeast overgrowth, and she was a carbohydrate addict. She was eating pretty much 80-90% of her diet was carbohydrate-based food, so she was really feeding the beast, so to speak, the yeast, the beast of the yeast, right? She was feeding that through aggressive carbohydrates. So, Carbs, aggressive carbohydrates can lead to auto brewery syndrome. And that in and of itself can create, uh, again, it can create all the same side effects as, as, as small consumption of alcohol. So imagine, what does alcohol do? It suppresses the brain, slows down your energy, makes your brain less clear and concise in its thought processes so you get fogginess, right? Or lack of clarity, inability to recall words as well. These are all symptoms of a basically a slow trickle of alcohol coming in as a result of an auto brewery that could occur as a result of a yeast overgrowth. So very, very important that you recognize that, especially if you've been on a bunch of antibiotics recently and you really have a lot of brain fog and you're really struggling and you don't know what's going on. It could very possibly be that those antibiotics created a yeast overgrowth that led again to that type of problem and that's uh, going back to the ketogenic diet a lot of people do really well when they have a yeast overgrowth 
on a ketogenic diet because you're taking away the predominant source of carbohydrates in the diet, which is what yeast ferment. Yeast love to survive by eating your carbohydrates. So if you're feeding them well, they're going to grow very well. And if you starve them out with something like a ketogenic diet, it can be pretty effective. Now, not everybody's suited the for way a ketogenic diet. The predominant source of carbohydrates in the diet, which is what yeast diet. ferment. Indeed, yeast a yeast overgrowth. But some people are finding it very, very helpful to do that. And they're also losing weight and they're also feeling so much better on that ketogenic diet. Again, this is not me advocating the ketogenic diet for everybody who's got a yeast overgrowth. But I just want you to understand one of the reasons why this diet can work is not because of the diet itself per se. It's because it stops that auto brewery process because you stop feeding the yeast. So one of the better diets to consider with a yeast overgrowth is a low fermentation diet, which means it doesn't mean you have to remove all carbohydrates. You can still eat lots of vegetables. You can still even eat small quantities of certain kinds of fruit, but you would want to avoid foods that are easily fermentable. And, uh, and, and again, that, that, that could be a number of different things, like potato, for example, is easily fermentable. Tapioca starch is easily fermentable. Corn, easy ferment. Grains are easy ferment. So again, you, you want to look at those types of things that can ferment very easy and feed into that problem. You want to remove them from the diet as you're trying to conquer an overgrowth of yeast. Now, one of the other things, you know, carbs, we talk about not just carbs, but grain. Uh, grain is a source of carbohydrates, but a lot of times grain is also a source of mold. In essence, it's where we can get a lot of mold exposure is through eating grain. There are a number of studies that show that grains are contaminated with mold and other forms of mold toxins, which is a major health threat and health issue in the United States today. As a matter of fact, some crops have to be recalled because of mycotoxin levels being too high. So grain is a source of where we can get mold exposure, but it's also a fuel. That's why mold grows on grain because mold eats and ferments grain. So when you take, for example, grain that's been stored in a bin and it starts to grow mold on it and that mold starts to proliferate and then we use that grain to make our food that we're getting that exposure potentially in that way. So. Again, this is one of the reasons why going grain-free can be a major, major impact or impact factor in reducing yeast overgrowth. Now, I want to show you another unique picture of because uh, we were talking about where does you know where does it affect people, and I showed you the tongue and I showed you the nail beds, but I want to show you one on the skin of someone's foot because this is kind of a unique presentation of the way yeast overgrowth might manifest on the foot. Um, you can see the, the buildup of the plaque and the skin and the overgrowth of multiple layers of skin. That actually goes away when you combat and beat the yeast overgrowth. So if you look down at your feet and that's what you're seeing, you really strongly want to consider that yeast might be a problem and that that's why that's on your feet. I've actually seen patients where their hands and their feet were totally covered in that type of skin abnormality presentation. Um, we, I said before, urinary tract, so if you struggle with chronic urinary tract infections or sinus infections, that can also be a place where we we'll get mold. We'll also see yeast overgrowth. One of the, probably the more common places is, let's draw it up here, is in the GI tract. And fortunately, we can measure this very accurately. The GI tract is one of the most common places that we'll see yeast overgrowth that leads to autoimmune disease, meaning yeast create toxins that can damage the gut lining, that can mobilize your immune system. And when your gut lining is being damaged and yeast are producing toxins, those things can get access to your bloodstream and create a molecular mimicry like effect that contributes to autoimmune disease. So GI tract mold or GI tract yeast overgrowths are very common. Candida albicans is a very, very common type of uh, of mold. Geotrichum is another type of mold that we'll commonly see in a GI tract. So again, there are multiple types of molds that can grow within a GI tract. And oftentimes where we'll see them start is as a result of chronic antibiotic use because some of the antibiotics, again, what are they doing? They're knocking out the bacteria in the GI tract. And so we're, if there is yeast there, the antibiotic won't affect the yeast. Now the yeast don't have competition. Remember, your gut's a lot like a forest. There are different plants and different trees and they're competing for sunlight and they're competing for soil and resources and water where your gut's the same way. The yeast is competing for resources against the bacteria and that's why your healthy microbiome is one of your best defenses
against a yeast overgrowth. So when you take an antibiotic, taking an antibiotic once has been shown to disrupt your microbiome for as long as two years. So this is where I go back and what I was talking about earlier is always, always, always ask for that doctor. Unless you're in the hospital and you're going to die and they're just trying to put an antibiotic in you to save your life. But if you're going into the doctor's office and you've got a kind of a mild cold or flu, general malaise, etc., they assume you have a, a bacterial infection and they want to give you an antibiotic, ask for the culture. Any doctor can run a culture test. Make sure you're asking for the culture. Make sure they're culturing for both yeast as well as bacteria before you jump into taking that antibiotic. We're finding that antibiotics can do a lot more damage than, than what was previously thought, and this is one of the mechanisms behind why it can. Now, that being said, if your life is in jeopardy, don't hesitate to take the antibiotic if your doctor's directing you down that path to try to save your life. But again, if it's non, a non-acute scenario, you want to make sure that this is happening. All righty. So let's see, we got a bunch of questions coming in. What if you test for food allergies and they come up positive? Okay, so can food allergies change, I think is the general gist of this question. And the answer is yes, food allergies can change. Your, your immune system changes every six to eight months. And so you can be, you can have an, what's called an acquired allergy where you develop an allergy to a food. And if you make the right moves and you get your diet cleaned up and you get your lifestyle cleaned up, your immune system normalizes, um, those acquired allergies can go away. Let's see here. I've read that yeast and inflammation are byproducts of excess unbound iron. Can you please comment on this? Look, iron toxicity is a lot less common. Um, can iron toxicity feed yeast? Yes, magnesium and B vitamins can feed yeast. Um, but not all inflammation and not all yeast are byproducts of excess unbound iron. So I would just be cautious in that. And I mean, there are a number of different ways that iron levels can be measured. Um, of course, a lot of our foods are fortified with iron and a lot of that food fortification, it's oxidized iron, so it's not really all that healthy for you. But most of our food products that are fortified with iron are actually going back to grain. And so this is, again, part of the reason I wrote no grain, no pain, with, instead of no gluten, no pain, was because it's not just the gluten. There are other things within the grain that can be, that can be problematic. Let's see here. Okay, so this is a great question. Okay, so from 18 to 28, I was an alcoholic. How do I test my liver to find out if it's fatty, and how do I restore my liver and restore my gut of candida overgrowth if it's present? This is a great question. Um, one of the things that, that you can do to test your liver is ask your doctor to run a liver ultrasound. Now, you can also run to test your liver. There are a few enzymes that you can have them look at, ALT and AST and bilirubin is a chemical in your blood and ALP is a chemical in your blood. These can all be elevated when we have liver damage. Another one is ferritin. So you can ask your doctor to measure those and if they're elevated, then you would suspect liver damage. But sometimes these tests come back normal because not always is blood, uh, is the damage great enough to create the change in the blood with these tests. And this is where an ultrasound can be very helpful. So ask your doctor to run an ultrasound of your liver where you can visibly see damage to the liver on an ultrasound. As far as how do you heal the liver, well, first things first, you have to remove what's creating the damage. So if you suspect that, if you're not an alcoholic today and you suspect that yeast overgrowth is playing a role, you've got to look at eradicating the yeast. One of my favorite things to do that is, it's a formula that actually I designed based on years of experience called Yeast Shield. And basically it just makes your gut environment very, very, um, very difficult for yeast to thrive. So it's, it's, a, it's a natural uh, conglomeration of different herbals that are antifungal in nature. So it makes it really hard for ye yeast or mold to thrive within your GI tract. Um, the other thing I would couple that with is a very strong probiotic. Um, what I formulate because it's dairy and grain free and a lot of them are not. So it's hard for me to make recommendations, but something called ultra biotic defense and it's a powdered probiotic with uh, 
uh, several hundred colony forming units, predominantly bifidobacteria and lactobacillus that um, can help to prevent yeast overgrowth as well. We're trying, what we're trying to do is introduce competition so that again, if you have good healthy bacteria in your gut, then there's less a capacity, less resources for yeast to use to try to thrive. So kind of combining uh, a natural antifungal with a natural uh, bacterial source that can prevent yeast overgrowth are two just really, really simple things you can do right away. Outside of that, I would change the diet to be low fermentation. And we've got some posts up on Gluten-Free Society on low fermentation diets. Um, because we don't want, again, we don't want to feed the beast. We don't want to feed the yeast. So a low fermentation diet, I would couple that at a bare minimum. But if you really wanted to get accurate with this, have yourself tested for yeast overgrowth. You can test in culture. And with cultures, you can get, if you're having the right culture done, you can get a sensitivity test, which tells you what would be the most effective at killing the yeast that you have. So for example, if you did a culture, your doctor did a culture, and he identified candida albicans in high quantities growing inside your GI tract, and you did what's called a, and he did what's called a sensitivity test, he could actually measure to see what plant extracts might be the most effective at killing that particular yeast that's living in you, as opposed to a, just a general broad spectrum antifungal. So for example, you can test yeast for oregano and caprylic acid and berberine and grapefruit seed extract and uva ursi and a number of other things that, that have known potential antifungal properties. And sometimes yeast have a resistance to some of these natural agents. I've seen people who came to see me, they were taking oregano for years and they had a massive yeast overgrowth and they were taking oregano to try to get rid of it and it wasn't effective because the yeast in them was actually oregano resistant. So the best way is to, is to get a culture and sensitivity test done. Let's see here. Can yeast impact pulsatile tinnitus? Wow, I love that question because I've actually seen that uh, be the case where yeast was creating pulsatile tinnitus. So the answer is yes. You Remember, you can get ear infections too, deep inner ear infections. You can get sinus infections that can affect and create a tinnitus. And yeast also produce byproducts that can be neurotoxic. And remember that Tinnitus can be triggered as a result of damage to the vestibular cochlear nerve, which is the nerve that feeds your inner ear and allows you to hear. So the answer is yes. And I oftentimes will see too, I'll see parasites associated with pulsatile tinnitus as well. So I would make sure that you, um, I think this, I don't know how to pronounce your name, Utisha. I'm going to, if I mangled it, I apologize. But that, that would be what I would, I would recommend that you go back to your doctor and have them test for a bare minimum of those things. So uh, it looks like I answered this question already. Um, is rhinitis and runny nose candida related? Yes, yeah, sinusitis, rhinitis can be candida related. Again, not, I'm, I want to be very clear. Not all forms of, of sinusitis or rhinitis are yeast, but many of them can be. And again, if you're assuming that they're bacterial and taking the antibiotic, this is where people get into trouble because it's that antibiotic that disrupts the microbiome. So if it is a yeast overgrowth, you don't fix it. You create bigger problems as a result of it. Okay, let's see here. So would a comprehensive stool analysis give good information for a yeast problem? That's a question from Vicki. And yes, Vicki, great question. Yes, it can. A comprehensive stool analysis can, depending on the type of comprehensive stool analysis, depending on, you know, depending on what's being measured. Not all stool analyses are the same. A lot of times when you go to the GI doctor, they're running a stool analysis, but they're only looking for parasites or blood, occult bleeding. So you have to get descriptive in what it is that you want the doctor to measure. And hopefully the doctor will, will work with you and measure those things if, if, um, Again, that's part of the other part of the battle is sometimes you go to the doctor with a suggestion and they don't want to help you with your suggestion because they want to be quick to dismiss it. Now, a question coming in, does my probiotic prevent SIBO? Um, it can. I mean, it, it can help prevent SIBO, but that's kind of a loaded question. And I'm sorry, Trisha, I can't answer it better than that. 
because sometimes, depending on the type of SIBO, and the type of SIBO stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, there are different types of SIBO. Different bacteria will overgrow. And so some probiotics can actually make SIBO worse. So it depends. It, that's a, again, that's why I say it's a loaded question. I can't, I can't give you an exact answer because it depends on the person. Let's see here. What liquid vitamins are available for a child who can't swallow pills and has celiac? Um, there aren't a lot of, in my experience and opinion, there aren't, there are not a lot of great brands for a child with celiac simply because most of the liquid vitamins are either full of sugar from corn or corn based flavoring agents and children with celiac disease do not do well with that. You're better off getting a, a solid multi. We actually have a chewable. If your child is able to chew, we have something called ultra nutrient kids we, we'll put a link in the feed of that for you if your child can chew this is an option because it's no corn in it whatsoever but it's a solid multivitamin multi-mineral uh, that is not a liquid one of the problems with liquids is stability it's hard to get stability when you're creating a liquid a multivitamin mineral formulation Yeah, I love this question and comment too. Misty's saying, can you please speak about the benefits of yeast? We aren't meant to be yeast free, correct? Can you go overboard in trying to kill yeast? You can, and I love that question because look, yeast, I, I don't want you guys walking away from this thinking that, okay, we gotta throw everything at trying to kill yeast every day all the time. We have natural normal yeast colonies within our GI tract, but it's a balance. It's when the yeast grow out of control. How do we feed that yeast? How do we make that yeast go out of control? We suppress the immune system. We take a, a aggressive antibiotics. You know, if you're on chronic medication for pain like steroids or chronic medication for aller, excuse me, for allergies, those are ways that you can develop a yeast overgrowth. Meaning you're you're not you, you're not necessarily causing a yeast infection as much as you are allowing what's already there in controlled amounts to grow out of control and create symptoms. But yeast do have benefits as well. The other way is to overproduce car or overconsume carbohydrates. Carbohydrate consumption, you know, in our society today, what do I have room to draw here? Let's see. If that's a plate, today in our world today, most people are 60 plus percent carbohydrates and then somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 percent protein or 20 percent protein and 10 percent fat and that will vary because a lot of people don't you know they buy the skim milk the skim cheese the skim everything which is horrible for you by the way and they're eating all they're eating is carbohydrates either through grain um, or through fruits most people have sweet tooths that are mad and one of the reasons they have sweet tooths is because a yeast overgrowth can create craving for carbohydrate and then because that's what they want to eat and when you let them grow out of control they can hijack your nervous system in your brain they can actually produce different neurotransmitters that make you crave sugar and so you eat carbohydrates and you keep feeding them and they're very happy because they have uh, they have grown to a greater degree and and they're getting food and they're getting fed on a regular basis so where do we want to start if we're really thinking about okay cutting down carbohydrates in the diet you know, 60, 20, 10, 60, 30, 10, somewhere in that neighborhood where a lot of people are, you really want to think more along the lines of what I call the rule of thirds, which is a third carb, a third fat, a third protein. Now, this is variable, and this is not a hundred in a, in, ingrained in stone for everyone, but this is a good place to start if you're looking at just trying to change your diet to see how you might experience a change or the way that you feel. Eating a balance as opposed to an imbalance because over -consume, again, overconsuming carbohydrates is one of the plagues of modern humanity. It feeds a yeast overgrowth. Yeast overgrowths can lead to a multitude of different types of illnesses, but chronic inflammation that is caused by yeast overgrowth can create damage in any tissue in your body. It's known to contribute to autoimmune disease. Yeast overgrowth is one of the most important but little discussed triggers for cancer and heart disease. And diabetes. I mean, you think about what diabetes is. Diabetes is carbohydrate toxicity, right? You overconsume carbohydrates to the point that your organs can't keep up with your consumption, and so your body starts to break down. 
right? And part of that breakdown, if we study diabetics, I showed you the auto brewery studies earlier, those studies, some of them were done on diabetics because diabetics have a greater tendency to have auto brewery syndrome because why? Because they're eating a carbohydrate toxic diet, which feeds yeast. And when they're feeding yeast, they're creating this scenario of chronic inflammation and problems. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of clarity. Yeast are, again, yeast aren't bad, but they can become very bad very quickly. A uh, question coming in, is ultrabiotic defense powder the same as the capsule or is the powder stronger? Powder is much stronger. So where the powder contains about 400 billion, the pill contains about 50 billion. So there's a pretty big difference between the dosing. How can you tell if your symptoms are gluten related or yeast overgrowth related? Great question, Anani. And the way you, you, the way you determine is you test. And those of you who have listened to me for any length of time know my stance on testing for gluten sensitivity. Don't go run celiac panels because celiac panels are not accurate in the way to assess for gluten sensitivity. Genetics, genetic testing. We'll put another, feed, another link up in the feed for you on genetic testing. But if you really want to know about gluten, the best way to know about it is genetic testing. If you really want to know about yeast, the best way is, depending on where you suspect the yeast is overgrowing, if it's in the gut, a stool test with a culture insensitivity is the best way to try to ascertain a yeast problem. If you suspect a systemic yeast overgrowth, you can check the bloodstream. Um, you, of course, there are visible signs of yeast overgrowth, skin rashes, um, like what I've shown you today, yellow discoloration of the toenails, the, of the fingernails can be symptoms. Jaundice and yellow discoloration of the skin can be a symptom of a yeast overgrowth. So again, it, it just, the best way to know is to test. So here's one of the funny things about eating a lot of yogurt, depending on, so this is another person that's chiming in that they have scleroderma, they're getting yeast infections, they take probiotics and they eat yogurt, but they're not sure what to do. Probiotics can actually contribute to a yeast overgrowth depending on which probiotic you're using. Most probiotics, or not probiotics, I'm sorry, scratch that, I meant yogurt. Yogurt can create a yeast infection depending on which yogurt you're using. Most of these yogurt brands are full of corn syrup. They're full of sugar. So even though they have fermentated bacteria in them, you're still eating and feeding all the yeast if, if that's coming back. So if you're using one of those sugars, sugar-loaded yogurts, right, the flavored yogurts basically are the ones loaded with sugar, then you can actually, you know, you can actually keep recreating or, or feeding that yeast overgrowth despite the fact that you're trying to refeed your good healthy bacteria or repopulate your good healthy bacteria. Let's see. Can yeast cause endometriosis, pain, anxiety, and sleeping problems? Yes, yes, yes. It can create all three. That doesn't mean yeast is the only trigger for those, but it certainly can. Uh, gastric cardiac syndrome? Yes, it can. It can contribute to that. Remember, one of the things that yeast can do, it can destroy. Yeast overgrowth can damage the GI lining and it can create gastric symptoms. But once the lining is disrupted, once we have an intestinal permeability, we can get access to the cardiac wall. Um, there are actually a number of studies showing that association. Um, another, another interesting one on, on gluten, not so much yeast, is, is pericarditis as a result of gluten sensitivity. And a lot of people have that diagnosis and didn't realize that it was being caused by gluten. Is die-off real? Yeah, die-off is very real. Um, Yeast die off when you're actually starving them out. They're going to try to fight back, and part of that, and part of that fighting back is, is again yeast steal methyl groups. Methyl groups are very important for detoxification. So what happens for a lot of people is, as you're fighting yeast and they start fighting back, and some of them are dying as their cells are breaking open. They're releasing chemical toxins that are creating a lot of havoc in your gut. Now one of the things that you can do to fight die off or to reduce die off is taking activated charcoal can be a very effective way to reduce the symptoms of die-off and um, and a lot of people just if you're so if you're struggling if every time you try to go on a yeast-free diet or try to try to supplement it and you feel totally horrible you're in bed with a flu you can't get up and you feel awful
you might consider adding activated charcoal to what you're doing. It might help that become a little bit more effective for you. Why would a person with a toenail fungus test negative for yeast? Depends on the test. If you did a scraping of the toenail fungus, it'd probably come back positive. So uh, again, you can have a, a toenail yeast infection that is isolated to the toenail when there's not one in the GI tract. The yeast can affect you in different areas. For some it's systemic, but not for everyone is it. Is it true that invasive yeast overgrowth can cause cancer? Yes, it is true, and there's a lot of research to back that up. Um, so, so to answer that question, yes, there's a link between yeast overgrowth and cancer. Okay, let's see here. Oh, Chris for saying, by the way, I'm in chapter two of your book. Thank you greatly for your research and willingness to help. You're welcome, Chris for thanks for chiming in and thanks for reading uh, No Grain, No Pain. And those of you who are on tonight and don't have your copy, of no grain, no pain. Make sure you pick it up. You can pick it up at Barnes and Noble or Amazon.com or any other major book carrier. But uh, it's you know it's one of the things that I recommend highly that you have when you come to the Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show as a fundamental basis for knowledge. Okay, thanks for all you do. You're welcome. This is coming from Marianne. Is it important to treat an overgrowth of candida or dysbiosis first? I have a stool test result showing candida. Um, let's see here. Okay, so candida plus a lot of different other types of things. If you have a candida overgrowth and you have a dysbiosis at the same time, so those of you who don't know what a dysbiosis is, it's the overgrowth of abnormal bacteria. Sometimes they can be potential pathogens and create problems. You don't need to necessarily separate that out. You can go after both of them simultaneously. Um, and this is where it's important to get that type of culture testing done because if you've got multiple types of problems, dysbiotic bacteria combined with yeast overgrowth, but you know what is effective at, at taking care of both of those entities, then you can go after them simultaneously. But you don't need to separate it out. A lot of people try to separate it out, and what ends up happening is it just ends up taking an extra six months to get rid of the problem. So it's not something that necessarily you have to separate out. Great question. Will being constipated during a three-day stool test for yeast alter the results? Um, as long as you're getting a solid specimen, I mean, if you're constipated, you, you know, what you may consider during this is using vitamin C powder, uh, three to five grams to create a looser bowel to get more of the movement so that you can collect more of a specimen for analysis. Um, and the, the vitamin C, I reckon there's a particular brand I recommend. It's called Detox C because it's not corn derived. It's actually organic wild African potato derived derived. Let's see here. Oh, somebody's asking, how do you take yeast shield? Is it one or two per day? And how long do you take it for? Um, generally speaking, it's four a day, so two twice a day. If you've, if you've, if you've got a really nasty yeast uh, overgrowth, it's four a day, along with, uh, with biotic defense or ultrabiotic defense. And, you know, I wouldn't take it longer than 10 weeks. Um, you know, when I have somebody in my in my office, we're monitoring that process, so it's it's a little bit different. I'll oftentimes take people out for about 10 weeks, but I'll be monitoring them. Um, but if you're on your own doing it on your own, I wouldn't really necessarily go longer than six weeks. Uh, and if you're not seeing a difference or noticing any improvements, then it probably is a better idea to get tested and work with somebody. Okay. I love this. Jeff is saying, I'm gluten-free since last November, but had found out just yesterday that carbs are a problem. Why can I not be affected by ice cream, but badly affected by gluten-free Pop-Tarts? First of all, there's no such thing as a gluten-free Pop-Tart. Uh, and, and Jeff, I'm not saying any of this to pick on you. I want you to read No Grain, No Pain because you're confused about what gluten actually is. And a lot of people are, to be honest with you. There's no such thing as a gluten-free grain. All grains contain some form of gluten. And this is kind of the newsflash that not a lot of people get um, until they're struggling and struggling and struggling after they've changed their diet and still having issues. Um, 
it could be the carbohydrates, it could be the yeast overgrowth, but it could also be the fact that the gluten-free Pop-Tart itself, depending on whether or not they're using a corn or a rice base, most of them use corn or rice bases in their, in their substitute. And that, again, those can be very, very damaging to somebody with a gluten sensitivity because they do have a form of gluten in them that can create inflammation. Is yeast shield effective for uh, an active infection or as a preventative? I'm also reading your book, so helpful. Look, I don't view, um, so again, if you're using it as an active infection, you need to probably, uh, Marianne, be using it in conjunction with a healthcare provider, practitioner who's experienced in that, uh, because it can, be, it can be kind of used in both aspects. Oh, hi, Nancy. Nancy's chiming in from New Mexico. Let's see here. Okay. So I wanted to, I wanted to also make sure I talked about... Let's see here. I want to make sure I get both my audiences here. We're streaming dual. Okay, I like this question. Edward's asking, what about brewer's yeast and red rice yeast? Don't recommend red rice yeast, especially if you're taking it to lower your cholesterol to statin. And statins block vitamin D and CoQ10. And even though it's not as powerful as a statin, it still has the same effect. Um, read the book, The Cholesterol Myth, if you want to know why you shouldn't be worried about your cholesterol. As far as brewer's yeast is concerned, uh, I don't recommend brewer's yeast if you're struggling to overcome a chronic illness. Uh, it's just not a good idea the way it's produced. It's, it, there are a lot of chemicals that go into the production of that particular product. So don't, make, don't really recommend it. Okay. Okay, so again... If we're going back to yeast overgrowth, candida mold, fungus, yeast, also mold, all kind of synonyms. So where clarity can be defined is when you're doing the culture test to, de to determine the species of yeast and then what would potentially kill it. Lots of things can cause a yeast overgrowth, including antibiotics, immune suppressants, allergy medications, steroids, and acid medications, which we haven't mentioned yet. But they suppress stomach acid, which is one of the ways we kill yeast when we eat it in our foods before it can colonize in our lower GI tract. So medications can cause it. For a lot of people, it's diet. It's carbohydrate toxic diets that overfeed or overfeed the populations of yeast that are always present in your gut and allow them to grow out of control, creating toxic chemicals that can penetrate into the bloodstream, leading to a systemic inflammation that has been linked to a number of different chronic disorders meaning um, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, bone loss, etc. So don't take a yeast overgrowth lightly. If you've got one, you want to make sure you get it analyzed and that you get it taken care of. Diet change is mandatory to be successful at getting rid of or eradicating an overgrowth of yeast. And oftentimes probiotics along with antifungals are, play a very, very, very important role in this process as well. But diet change if you don't change your diet, nothing will happen. No matter how many antifungals you throw at it, no matter how many probiotics you throw at it, if it doesn't, if you're trying to kick a yeast overgrowth and you're not changing your diet, you're not going to be successful for any length of time. You're going to continue to struggle and battle. Yeast can affect the GI tract, the skin, the tongue, the nail beds, the sinus, the urinary tract. Um, those are some of the most common areas that we're going to see yeast overgrowth. So I gave you some examples and pictures earlier today. So again, I'm just kind of summarizing everything that we talked about. Yeast can, because it can produce alcohol in auto brewery, can affect the liver. So a lot of times people will have liver damage, jaundice skin. They'll have things called hemolytic anemias, which are when the blood cells break open too quickly because of the alcohol. They'll have gastric irritation because of the alcohol. Remember, alcohol is a gastric irritant. So if you're producing your own alcohol with your own brewery factory because of a yeast overgrowth, you can irritate the gut lining and the, and the stomach lining and create a GERD-like symptom or a GERD-like syndrome. So be aware that all those things are possibilities and can happen. Um, if you have uh, any last questions, make sure you type them in because we're getting ready to wrap it up. I want to make sure that all of you um, 
If you know somebody who's going to benefit from this information, make sure that you share it. You can share it in the feed. You can also copy and paste the link of the replay and just get them a copy. Get this information into their hands. Remember, our mission is to help 100 million people. If you don't already have it, make sure you go visit us at glutenfreesociety.org and pick up a copy, a free copy of the Gluten-Free Survival Kit. And if you haven't yet, make sure you pick up your copy of No Grain, No Pain. It is the Nutrition Bible for all things that we discuss every Monday evening at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for the pick, Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. And if you've got topics you'd like to see us cover, please email us at glutenology at gmail.com and submit those requests. I'm happy to entertain a variety of different topics. You just have to let me know what you'd like me to cover and we'll make sure that we do our best to get to it. So we will see you back next week, same time, 6 p.m. Again, that's Central Time, Texas Time. And uh, have a great week. And hopefully, after what you learned today, it's a going to be a great week moving away from yeast overgrowth. Take care.